This is Saurabh, and, and you're listening to my favorite talk show, The BG Show with Aditya. It is a universal truth that 40 minutes ride to college has always been monotonous for all of us. My cab mates would either be sleeping or texting or engage in private conversation with their friends or listening to songs on their mobile phones. All had similar experiences while traveling in metro, cabs or buses to and fro from home to school or college as well as work. So what would I do during that time? I would take out the Walkman out of my bag, plug in the earphone and listen intently to a sports match. Now this very device, the Walkman, is now in the vintage section of electronic devices with many others. This was almost a dozen years ago. The usage of digital media sites was rudimentary. The medium of radio was in vogue and watching videos in a vehicle is never recommended because it could be harmful to our eyes. So the only medium of listening to a sports match was through the audio medium. A successfully organized sports match requires the participation of a multitude of stakeholders, that is teamwork and collaboration between different groups spread across a stadium. Let's look at these stakeholders one by one who are involved in the successful conduct of a sports match. There are the ground staff and the ground keepers who make sure that the playing area in a stadium is smooth so that the athletes don't slip and hurt themselves. They make sure that whatever provisions are to be made for the athletes and the officials in the ground, they are made. Then, of course, how can we have a sports match without an audience or the spectators? The contemporary times is an anomaly, but any sports match, whether it's professional, amateur, at the domestic level, at the international level, it cannot have that atmosphere unless the audience is involved. And when I say audience, I mean real audience, not the virtual audience that is being seen right now. Other crucial and important stakeholders would include the sponsors and the financiers, the governing bodies like the NFL, UEFA, International Olympic Association and others. And then what about the athletes? They are also an active stakeholder in a match. Without athletes, all these stakeholders are found wanting. Then of course, the backroom staff for a sports team, that is the team management, the coaching and the mentoring staff. Most of the stakeholders I mentioned here work on the sly with the exception of the athletes. But anyone I missed out, let's see. Spectators, sponsors, governing bodies, ground staff, team management, the ground staff, the coaching and the mentoring staff. It still feels that an important stakeholder is missing. There's just something missing in a sports match without which the sports match cannot be successfully conducted. Now let me give you a clue. These stakeholders along with the athletes are the face of a sports match which means that we see these individuals along with the athletes all the time or we hear them through the audio medium while listening intently to a sports match. Did you get the hint? No? Let me give you another clue. Their job description entails creating the environment around the match. They can equally create that atmosphere of excitement or dullness. This group has the onerous task of making us visualize the stadium, the weather, the reaction of the audience, 
if there are more boos than yars, the ground conditions, when we would travel in our vehicles, we would have often turned on our radio to listen to a sports match. Now imagine you are listening to a sports match on your electronic devices. The listener rises when the pitch and volume of the commentator rise. It falls when the pitch and volume goes down. The heart starts beating faster as the match reaches its closing moments and the way the commentators embellish it. This group has to make the match appealing to all age groups, the young, the old and the children. Commentators are like evaluators. They do a SWOT analysis of the match, the strengths, weakness, opportunities and threats. They talk about past performances and how that tends to shape their current performance. If an athlete has performed brilliantly in a previous match, but they are not able to repeat the same in the next couple of matches, benefit of the doubt is still given considering the stature. And that is why being a sports commentator is one of the most exciting things an individual can do because of all the excitement involved because what their role entails. Keeping the listeners excited right from the point the match starts till it ends. T.S. Eliot Waste Land Ganga was sunken and the limp leaves waited for rain while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavant. The jungle crouched, hummed in silence, then spoke the thunder. Datta, what have we given, my friend, blood shaking my heart? The awful daring of a moment's surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract. By this and this only we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries or in memories shaped by the beneficent spider or under seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty rooms. Dhyadavam. I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his prison. Thinking of the key, each confirms a prison. Only at nightfall, ethereal rumors revive for a moment a broken Corulonus. Dayamyata, the boat responded. Gaily to the hand expelled with sail and oar. The sea was calm, your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. I sat upon the shore, fishing with the arid plain behind me. While I at least set my lands in order, London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. Saskos nel foco che gli afina, quando fiam giuti celidon, o swallow, swallow, la prince the acquaintain a la tour obiel. These fragments I have showed against my ruins. And then, il fitio, here no mos mad again, datta daya davan damiata. Homer's Iliad Book 1 And now from his depths the proud runner groaned. You know, you know, why labor through it all? You know it all so well. We read it thief once. Aetion's sacred citadel. We ravaged the place, hauled all the plunder here, and the armies passed it around, share and share alike. And they chose the beauty Kairises for Agamemnon. But soon her father, the holy priest of Apollo, the distant deadly archer, Kairises approached the last trim ships of the Argives, armed in bronze, 
to win his daughter back, bringing a priceless ransom and bearing high in hand a wound on a golden staff. The reach of the god who strikes from worlds away. He begged the whole Achaean army, but most of all, two supreme commanders, Atreus's two sons. All ranks of Achaeans cried out their assent, respect the priest except the shining ransom, but it brought no joy to the heart of Agamemnon. Our high and mighty king dismissed the priest with a brutal order ringing in his ears and shattered with anger the old man withdrew but apollo heard his prayer he loved him deeply loosed his shaft at the archives withering plague and now the troops began to drop and die in droves the arrows of god went shivering left and right whipping through the achaeans's vast encampment but the old seer who knew the cause full well reveals the will of the archer god Apollo and I was the first mother I urged them all. Abase the god at once. That's when the fury gripped the son of Atreus. Agamemnon leapt to his feet and hurled his threat, his threats being driven home. One girl, Kyrises, the fury-eyed Achaeans ferry out in a Fast trim ship to Kyrie's island, laden with presents for the god. The other girl, just now the heralds came and led her away from camp. You mother, if you have any power at all, protect your son. Go to Olympus. Plead with Zeus if you ever warmed his heart with a word or any action. Time and time again I heard your claims in father's halls, boasting how you and you alone of all the immortals rescued Zeus, the lord of the dark storm cloud, from ignominious stark defeat. That day the Olympians tried to chain him down. Hera, Poseidon, lord of the sea and palace Athena, you rushed to Zeus, dear goddess, broke those chains, quickly ordered the hundred handed to tape Olympus, that monster whom the immortals call Briarius. But every mortal calls the sea god's son Aegeon, though he's stronger than his father. Now he sat, flanking Cronus's son, Gargantuan in the glory of it all, and the blessed gods were struck with terror then they stopped shackling Zeus. Mind him of that. Now go and sit beside him, grasp his knees, persuade him somehow to help the Trojan cause, to pin the Achaeans back against their ships, trap them round the bay and mow them down, so all can reap the benefits of their King, so even the mighty eight weeds can see how mad he was to disgrace Achilles, the best of the Achaeans. And Thetis answered, bursting into tears, O oh my son, my sorrow, why did I ever bear you? All I bore was doom. Would to God you could linger by your ships without a grief in the world, without a torment? doomed to a short life, you have so little time, and not only short now, but filled with heartbreak too, more than all the other men alive, doomed twice over, out of a cruel fate I bore you in our halls, still I shall go to Olympus crowned with snow, and repeat your prayer to Zeus, who loves the lightning. Perhaps he will be persuaded, but you, my child, stay here by the fast ships, wage on at the Achaeans. Just keep clear of every foray in the fighting. Only yesterday, Zeus went off to the ocean river to feast with the Ethiopians, loyal, lordly men. All the gods went with him, but in twelve days, 
the father returns to Olympus. Then for your sake, up I go to the bronze floor, the royal house of Zeus. I'll grasp his knees. I think I'll win him over. P.G. Woodhouse, stiff upper lip jeeves. I tried to pour oil on the trouble W.S. Probably just kidding, don't you think? No, I don't. He didn't say it with a twinkle in his eye. No, nor with a light laugh. No, you might have not noticed it. Very easy to miss these light laughs. He meant every word he said. Then it was probably just a momentary spasm of what you'd call it irritability. We all have them. She ground a tooth or two. At least it looked as if that was what she was doing. It was nothing of that kind. He was harsh and bitter and he has been like that for a long time. I noticed it first at Brinkley. One morning we had walked in the meadows and the grass was all covered with little wreaths of mist and I said, didn't he sometimes feel that they were the elves' bridal veils? And he said sharply, no, never, adding that he had never heard such a silly idea in his life. Well, of course, he was perfectly correct, but it was no good pointing that out to a girl like Madeleine Basset. And that evening we were watching the sunset and I said, sunsets always made me think of the blessed damoiselle leaning out from the gold bar of heavens. And he said, who? And I said, the blessed damoiselle. And he said, never heard of her. And he said that sunsets made him sick and so did the blessed damosel and he had a pain in his inside. Saw so that the time had come to be a reasoner. This was at Brinkley. Yes, I see. After you had made him a vegetarian. Are you sure? I said, reasonering like nobody's business. That you were Altogether wise in confining him to spinach and what not, many a proud spirit rebels when warned of the proteins. And I don't know if you know it, but medical research has established that the ideal diet is one in which animal and vegetable foods are balanced. It's something to do with the something acids required by the body. I won't say she actually snorted, but the sound she uttered was certainly on the borderline of the snort. What nonsense! It's what the doctors say. Which doctors? Well-known Harley Street physicians. I don't believe it. Thousands of people are vegetarians and enjoy perfect health. Bodily health, yes, I said cleverly seizing on the debating point. But what of the soul if you suddenly steer a fellow off the stake and chops, it does something to his soul. My aunt Agatha once made my uncle, uncle Percy be a vegetarian and his whole nature became sore. Not I was forced to admit that it wasn't fairly sore already as anyone would be who was in constant contact with my aunt Agatha. But you'll find that that's all that's wrong with Gussie. He simply wants a mutton chop or two under his belt. Well, he's not going to have them. And if he continues to behave like a sulky child, I shall know what to do about it. I remember Stinker Pinker telling me once that toward the end of his time at Oxford, he was down in Bethnal Green spreading the light and a coster monger kicked him in the stomach. He said it gave him a strange, confused, dreamlike 
feeling and that's what Adeline Basses gave me now. She had spoken them from between teeth which if not actually clenched were the next thing to it and it was as if the substantial boot of a vendor of black oranges and bananas had caught me squarely in the solar plexus. Er, what will you do about it? Never mind, I put out a cautious feeler. Suppose, not that it's likely to happen, of course, but suppose Gussie, maddened by the abstinence, were to go off and tap into, well, to take an instance at random, cold steak and kidney pie, what would be the upshot? I had never supposed that she had it in her to give anyone a piercing look, but that is what she gave me now. I don't think even Aunt Agatha's eyes have bored more deeply into me. Are you telling me, Bertie, that Augustus has been eating steak and kidney pie? Good heavens, no, it was just a thing gummy. I don't understand you. What do the call questions that aren't really questions begins with an H? Hypothetical. That's the word. It's just a hypothetical question. Oh, well, the answer to it is that if I found that Augustus had been eating the flesh of animals slain in anger, I would have nothing more to do with him. She said and she biffed off, leaving me a spent force and a mere shell of my former self. The following day dawned bright and fair. At least I suppose it did. I didn't see it dawning myself, having dropped off into a troubled slumber some hours before it got its nose down to it. But when the mists of sleep cleared and I was able to attend to what was going on, sunshine was seeping through the window and the ear detected the chirping of about 750 birds, not one of them unlike me, appeared to have a damn thing on his or her mind. I free a punch as I've ever struck and it gave me the pip to listen to them, for melancholy had marked me for her own, as the fellow said, and all this buck and heartiness simply stepped up the gloom in which my yesterday's chat with Madeline Besse had plunged me. Well, may be imagined her obiter dicta, as I believe they are called, had got right in amongst me. This, it was plain, was no mere lover's tiff to be cleared up with a couple of tears and a kiss or two, but a real class A rift, which, if prompt steps were not taken through the proper channels, would put the lute right out of business and make it as mute as a drum with a hole in it. And the problem of how those steps were to be taken defeated me. Two iron wheels had clashed. On the one hand, we had Madeleine's strong anti-flesh food bias. On the other, Gussie's firm determination to get all the cuts of the joint that were coming to him. What I asked myself would the harvest be, and I was still shuddering at the thought of what the future might hold when Jeeves trickled in with a morning cup of tea. So I said absently as he put it on the table. Usually I spring at the refreshing fluid like a seal going after a slice of fish. I was saying that we are fortunate in having a fine day for the school treat, sir. I sat up with a jerk, upsetting the kappa as deftly as if I had been the Reverend H.P. Pinker.
for more awesome content. Tune in to the next episode of the weekly show with Aditya.